Hi everyone, a very warm welcome to a talk on Hari Raya Pasa and Hari Raya Haji. Um, this event is organized by the Center of Singapore Tamil Culture and supported by uh, NLB and our supporting partners, uh, Singapore Book Council and Hash Peace. So Singapore, we've always prided ourselves as being this um, epitome of multiculturalism um, and a model for multiculturalism, multiculturalism for other countries. But even as a society, I think there's a long way to go in really understanding the nuances of different faiths and different cultures. And one way to do that is to have more dialogues. For example, as our event, Salamat Hari Raya, a talk on Hari Raya, um, Haji and Hari Raya Posa. So today I'm very, very happy to have with us a very eminent speaker, Mr. Muhammad Imran Muhammad Taib, is a director of Houthi Private Limited an intercultural and Asian heritage consultancy based in Singapore. He is also the founder and board member of the Center for Interfaith Understanding. He writes and researches on the issues of multiculturalism, interfaith, and Malay socio-religious life. Some of his commentaries have appeared in Today, Chow News Asia, The Straits Times, Barita Haryan, and South China Morning Post. He is also the co-editor of Buddhi Kirtik Tune 2019, a compilation of essays on issues in the Malay community. So I'm sure all of you can agree that there's no better person to be today to answer all our questions about Hari Raya, Haji, Hari Raya Pasa. What are the differences between uh, the Muslim, how these festivities are celebrated and observed between the Malay uh, Muslim community and Muslim community, communities elsewhere? I'm here to share on the cultural celebrations of Hari Raya Pasa and Hari Raya Haji. Um, of course, um, when it comes to the celebrations, all of us are experts, right? Because uh, uh, all of us, uh, especially uh, Muslims, uh, uh, here in Singapore, we all celebrate Hari Raya Puasa and also Hari Raya Haji. So all of us actually know uh, a bit more uh, uh, about these uh, festivities uh, and what I'll be sharing might be familiar to those who are uh, celebrating these two festivals. Uh, but for those who are not familiar with it, you might find some interesting things might even find affinity with the way uh, some uh, festivals are being uh, celebrated in your own cultures and we can see where we can connect and uh, um, learn a little bit more insight about the significance and the meaning of these uh, celebrations. Uh, Hari Raya Puasa and also Hari Raya Haji, uh, of course they are known uh, by various terms but uh, for consistency I'll, I'll just uh, stick to Hari Raya Puasa and Hari Raya Haji. Uh, it's actually a global religious festival uh, celebrated by Muslims all over the world. So uh, regardless of the uh, sex or denominations, uh, uh, all Muslims uh, celebrate these two festivals. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's really a global religious festival. Uh, and also the, the way it's being celebrated might take different forms according to the different cultures they are located. So... Uh, do take note of that. Uh, and secondly, my presentation will focus more on Singapore, uh, particularly uh, uh, within the Malay community, uh, which I identify myself to belong to. Uh, but also, uh, even though I'm focusing on Singapore, let's take note that the cultural forms is not something that is uh, exclusive to Singapore, but there are cultural affinity to, to the region because uh, we are located in, in uh, Malay, Indonesian world or Southeast Asia. And therefore a lot of the cultural practices is not uh, necessarily unique to Singapore. Um, like I've mentioned, the emphasis will be on the Malays, uh, but the celebration definitely is not exclusive to Malays. And I do know that there are friends, uh, uh, Tamil speaking friends uh, who celebrate uh, Hari Raya also. Uh, because uh, we, it's a Muslim festival, yeah? So it's not a Malay festival. Uh, but given that uh, 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 majority of Muslims here are Malays, so it has a lot of uh, Malay cultural flavor to it, but definitely not necessarily uh, uh, restricted to the Malay community. However, I'm more familiar with the Malay community and therefore I will uh, not be speaking so much about how it's being celebrated in other uh, uh, cultures uh, um, uh, beyond the Malays, yeah? Um, while the significance of the festival remains in terms of the philosophy of it, in terms of the origin, in terms of uh, why it's being celebrated, uh, but the forms of the celebration may uh, differ according to cultures, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, but at the same time also, 
uh, we do take note that uh, the celebration itself evolved over time. Yeah, I mean, uh, in this part of the world, for example, uh, it's quite different when you celebrate it in Kampong uh, compared to in uh, housing estates uh, like in Singapore. Yeah, uh, and in the region, for example, in Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, there is the tradition of mudik. Mudik means go back to your home villages to visit your parents. Uh, so there will be mass uh, travel uh, from the cities to, to the villages uh, uh, during this uh, period in time. Uh, but in Singapore, it's just a matter of traveling from one estate to another, so it's not so uh, uh, spectacular. Yeah, um, like my parents live in Woodlands, I live in Pasiris, so it's just a matter of going from Pasiris to Woodlands. Um, now, uh, I also want to note that this is not a definitive or comprehensive take on the two festivals. Uh, so definitely, I would be looking forward to hearing some of your sharings also on how this, the festival is being celebrated uh, within your own uh, family circles or within your own uh, uh, community. Now, um, have I mentioned Hari Raya is a religious festival, uh, but with local cultural nuances. And let me elaborate on that. Um, let's take a look at the religious aspects of the festival first, because it's, uh, primarily a religious festival. Um, firstly, uh, Hari Raya is a term that is used uh, in the Malay language. Uh, the Arabic term is Eid, which means festival, celebration, or it could also mean holiday or a feast day. So uh, Eid is the term that is being used uh, by Muslims all over the world when it comes to this. So Hari Raya is the Malay, Malay nice uh, uh, word for Eid. Uh, and there are two major festivals in the Islamic tradition. So there's Idul Adha, which is the festival of the sacrifice. Uh, uh, Adha means uh, sacrifice. Uh, and also Idul Fitri, festival of the breaking of fast. Uh, Fitr or Fitra means uh, natural disposition. So I will explain this a little bit more later. Uh, but these are the two main festivals uh, in Islam. Uh, and Idul Adha is uh, Hari Raya Haji, uh, or Malays also call it uh, uh, Hari Raya Aidil Adha and Idul Fitri uh, is Hari Raya Puasa or Hari Raya Aidil Fitri. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, Idul Adha is known as the greater festival or the major festival. And uh, um, sorry, uh, there's a mistake there. Uh, the second one should be Idul Fitri. Idul Fitri is the lesser festival, which is the, considered as a secondary festival. Uh, but here in this part of the world, it's the other way around. Uh, we tend to celebrate uh, Idul Fitri uh, in much more uh, greater ways, yeah? in, 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 in a more pompous way uh, with a lot of uh, um, festivities uh, revolving around it uh, compared to Idul Adha. Yeah? But uh, at least in the Islamic tradition, Idul Adha is the main festival and Idul Fitri is the lesser festival. Now, Idul Adha is celebrated on the 10th day uh, uh, of the 12th month uh, in the Islamic calendar. Uh, the month is called Zulhija uh, and it's observed for four days. Yeah. So this has got to do with the, uh, the towards the end of the uh, Hajj season uh, where Muslims uh, go to Mecca to perform the pilgrimage. Uh, Idul Fitri, on the other hand, uh, is the first day of the 10th month uh, of the Islamic calendar. Uh, and that month is called Shawal, which is the 10th month, uh, which comes after the month of Ramadan, which you are familiar with. Ramadan is the month where we are fasting. Uh, and Idul Fitri in the Islamic tradition is observed for one day only. Now, this is interesting uh, because, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, Hari Raya Puasa or Hari Raya Idul Fitri uh, is supposed to be the lesser festival, but it's observed uh, in greater ways here in this part of the world. Uh, and uh, many Malays uh, celebrate it uh, for, for a month even. Throughout the month of Shawal, it's still considered uh, Hari Raya. Uh, now, there might be reasons for that, uh, uh, such as, uh, you know, um, we have a lot of families to visit and you can't complete everything in, in, in one day. So uh, that 30 days is meant for you to continue celebrating and visiting friends, relatives uh, as part of uh, maintaining goodwill and uh, family and social ties. 
So, uh, uh, so that is a, a cultural nuance that we find in this part of the world. But in many other parts of the world, uh, it's usually celebrated only on the first day. Yeah. Uh, but both celebrations are observed globally by all Muslims. Yeah. Now, let's talk about Eid festival in the Malay context. Uh, as I've mentioned, it is known as uh, Hari Raya. And Hari Raya in the Malay language means day of celebration. Now, in Indonesia, it's also called as Hari Lebaran. Uh, Lebaran, uh, it's not clear the, the origin of the word, but uh, in, in Indonesian language, uh, usually it's called as Lebaran. Yeah, it's probably from, uh, from a Javanese uh, language. Um, Idul Fitri uh, is also then uh, uh, transliterated, become Hari Raya Idul Fitri or Hari Raya Puasa. Why it's called Hari Raya Puasa is because it marks the end of the fasting month. And therefore, after a whole month of fasting, uh, you celebrate uh, uh, the, the, the day uh, that uh, ends the fast as well as uh, the beginning of Shawal. That's why it's also called Hari Raya Puasa. Puasa means fasting, yeah? And Idul Adha is known as Hari Raya Idul Adha, or also known as Hari Raya Haji, uh, because it's, uh, it commemorates the Hajj or the pilgrimage season where Muslims go to Mecca to perform their Hajj or pilgrimage. Uh, it's also known as Hari Raya Kurban. Uh, you probably heard this word Kurban, it means uh, animal ritual sacrifice. Yeah, so there are many terms uh, and, uh, that you might come across to describe this festival. Uh, and uh, all of these uh, 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 can be commonly found uh, in, in the Malay world, yeah? Whether you call it Lebaran, Hari Raya, Aidil Fitri, or Hari Raya Puasa, Hari Raya Kurban, Hari Raya Haji, but it all refers to the same thing. Um, and I have mentioned earlier, in the Malay world, Hari Raya Puasa is celebrated longer uh, throughout the month of Shawal, and is often more joyous than Hari Raya Haji. Yeah, everyone gets ex excited during uh, Hari Raya Puasa. Uh, but when it comes to Hari Raya Haji, uh, it's uh, not, not so uh, uh, joyous. It's still a joyous event, but um, uh, lesser so. Yeah? Uh, people get more excited over Hari Raya Puasa. Now, um, the, this is interesting. The morning of Hari Raya Puasa, at least in the, in, 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 in the Malay community, is usually more, uh, we call it sayu, more melancholic. Uh, Possibly because the holy month of Ramadan has departed, so people feel a bit sad uh, that the uh, the holy month, which is the holiest month in the Islamic calendar, in fact, uh, Ramadan had just passed away, uh, and uh, we will encounter Ramadan only in the next year. So there's a bit of melancholy there. Uh, possibly also because uh, during uh, Hari Raya, there's a lot of practice of asking for forgiveness from close family members. So you begin to reflect on all the bad things that you probably have done to your loved ones, uh, especially your parents. And uh, if your parents still alive, you will ask for forgiveness. If not, then you remember uh, your parents. So there is a tinge of sadness, in, uh, especially in the morning of Hari Raya. Uh, and also that's why um, uh, some uh, Malays will uh, take the opportunity uh, after going to the mosque in the morning of Hari Raya, they will go and visit uh, uh, the cemetery. Uh, where they will visit the graves of their loved one. And this is a uh, part and parcel of Malay uh, practice of uh, uh, Hari Raya. Now, it's interesting that Hari Raya uh, or Idul Fitri uh, is meant to be a day of celebration of triumph over your base desires, over your, your inner demons. Uh, so it's meant to be a really joyous and happy occasion. Uh, but usually you find that in, in the morning of Hari Raya, it's much more... Uh, uh, melancholic uh, uh, and 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 uh, not so uh, happy until maybe afternoon onwards, where you start to go on house visiting. You get to reconnect with your family members, with your friends, and then uh, the the mood catch us, uh, catch up, and we become much more uh, happier. Yeah. So that that's a uh, one observation. Uh, the takbir or takbir is the um, glorifying of God. Uh, the that we hear in the in, in the morning of Hari Raya, uh, uh, that, that calls to prayer uh, where we will go to the mosque to perform the uh, Hari Raya prayer. Uh, the tune also evokes a kind of a melancholic feeling and also a kind of self-reflection on uh, how we have 
uh, fair during the holy month of Ramadan in terms of our purification of our soul, in terms of uh, uh, being a better person. Uh, although, of course, uh, Shawal is understood as uh, the first day of Shawal is understood as the day of triumph. Uh, but when we hear the Takbir, um, it gives a kind of uh, somber, somber mood uh, and also melancholic feeling. Now, I want to show you the uh, the uh, video uh, a clip of the Takbir with the um, uh, translation. So you can see the, the, the words of the Takbir, which is, uh, it evokes more of a, a, a kind of a mood of triumph uh, over uh, your fight against your inner self uh, throughout the month of Ramadan. But it also has some kind of melancholic feeling to it. Um, let me just share you the, the video, yeah? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illa Allahu, Allahu Akbar, Allah. So you 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 can hear the 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 mood of the uh, takbir, but at the same time also the words uh, are really about glorifying God. Um, uh, and this is the the to me personally is the best part of uh, Hari Raya when you hear the takbir either on the night before Hari Raya or on the, the morning itself. Now um, Hari uh, the, sorry uh, Ramadan. Um, Again, you cannot divorce uh, Hari Raya from the month of Ramadan. So if you look at the month of Ramadan itself, it's, it's a month of giving and charity. Uh, and during Ramadan, you will find here in, this, uh, in Singapore especially, uh, uh, and I'm pretty sure in many other parts of the world too, uh, there are many mosques will be extremely busy. Uh, and uh, one thing unique is that the mosques here in Singapore um, will prepare this uh, slightly spiced uh, rice porridge. It's known as bubo lambo. I'm not sure if uh, any of you have uh, uh, those uh, um, uh, uh, Muslims probably will be very familiar with this because uh, sometimes you go to the mosque to just get a free packet of uh, this uh, bubo or porridge. Um, but for those who have not, uh, I would recommend you to try it one day. But unfortunately, during the COVID situation, uh, 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 mosques uh, no longer provide this um, uh, service. Uh, but uh, in normal situation, they will be cooking this uh, bubo lambo and then it will be distributed free to, to uh, anyone who comes to the mosque uh, uh, and also be distributed to poor families and also any, anyone, any members of the public can just walk in and, and, and uh, have uh, uh, this rice porridge. Yeah? So uh, this tradition brings the bus to the mosque uh, here during Ramadan. Uh, you find a lot of volunteers will be preparing food for the breaking of fast and to welcome the uh, mosque goers who will perform the night prayers uh, 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 on the night of Ramadan, and this is known as uh, Taraweh. Now, um, let me go uh, a bit more into uh, Hari Raya Puasa itself, yeah? Okay, so why do Muslims celebrate Eid al-Fitri? Um, I've mentioned earlier that the ninth month is uh, seen as the uh, uh, holiest uh, month in Islam, uh, also because uh, during this month in Ramadan, that's when uh, uh, the Nuzul Quran uh, uh, occurred. Nuzul Quran means the uh, the revelation of the Quran uh, that, that came down to the Prophet. It, it, uh, for Muslims, we believe that it occurred during the month of Ramadan. That is why during the month of Ramadan, it is highly encouraged uh, for us to recite the Quran 
uh, and even to complete uh, reciting the entire Quran uh, within the month of Ramadan because it's the occasion of the revelation of God to the Prophet uh, Muhammad. Uh, during Ramadan also, uh, it's obligatory for Muslims to fast um, uh, unless they are exempted uh, or unable to. Yeah, so uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's obligatory uh, unless, for example, um, those who are exempted would be like uh, women who are having menstruation, or if you are ill and you need to take medication, uh, you are not able to fast. Uh, pregnant women also, if you um, uh, afraid uh, of the health uh, of both the mother and the child, uh, uh, and also people who are traveling uh, long distance also, they are. Uh, exempted from fasting. Uh, of course, uh, you have to pay back your fasting later on, yeah? uh, or you uh, have to pay a, a penalty in terms of feeding the poor and something like that. But it's uh, um, otherwise, it's ob obligatory for all Muslims to, to do so. Um, fasting is known as Saum. Uh, uh, of course, the uh, Malays call it Puasa, but the Arabic word is Saum. And it's the fourth pillar of Islam. And Muslims will fast from dawn to dusk. Um, uh, the moment uh, the sun uh, rises, then we have to start fasting until uh, the sun sets and then we can uh, uh, continue with our food and drinks. Uh, but it's not just food and drinks uh, during fasting that is prohibited. Uh, a, a person who's fasting cannot also uh, smoke or engage in sexual intercourse. These are things that will nullify uh, the fast. Uh, and during fasting, we are supposed to practice a lot of patience, um, practice good speech and conduct. So it's not just a matter of not eating or drinking. It's a whole training of the, of the self. Yeah? Um, and uh, of course, refraining from vices and other blameworthy conduct. Um, during the uh, fasting also, we are exhorted to strive for merits uh, through devotional worship. So you'll find that a lot of Muslims took the opportunity of the holy month of Ramadan to uh, become a bit more religious. Uh, so uh, they will engage in uh, uh, extra prayers um, and also recite the Quran, uh, especially performing the uh, night prayers or known as Taraweh. Uh, so you find that during Ramadan, a lot of uh, Muslims would go to the mosque. Of course, these are all in normal situation. Yeah, We are living in exceptional time of COVID, so uh, it's a whole different thing. Um, and also during the month of Ramadan, we are supposed to be much more charitable uh, and uh, donate to causes, uh, good causes, uh, donate to the poor and the needy uh, 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 and, and doing a lot of good deeds. Um, during the fasting month also, it is obligatory to pay the zakat fitra. The zakat is the religious tithe or religious tax uh, that all Muslims uh, uh, have to pay individually. Uh, and this is different from zakat harta or a wealth tax. Yeah, for zakat fitra, it's paid only during the month of Ramadan, um, and uh, the local or religious authority will will decide on the amount of it. Yeah, so normally uh, it's equivalent to the to the amount needed to feed a poor person, uh, and uh, the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore has calculated that to be about two point three kg of normal great rice, the, uh, in terms of feeding one poor person. Uh, uh, based on the local staple, uh, which of course you, you cannot be buying rice from NTUC and then you calculate 2.3 kg and then you give it to the poor. Uh, it, it's it's uh, converted to, to, to dollars and, and cents. Uh, and that amount uh, right now, uh, which uh, Mu'is had advised, is the, for the normal rate, it's about $5.10. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you can give a bit more if you want to, and uh, the higher rate will be seven dollar fifty cent, or you can pay anything between five ten to seven fifty. Uh, so uh, and it's per head. Like for example, in my family, if I have six uh, under my care, uh, like I have to pay for my children and also for my my spouse. Yeah? Uh, Ramadan is a month of devotion. It calls for purification and training of the soul. Uh, and hence, that's why the end of Ramadan is a very significant day uh, and it calls for a celebration. Uh, it's the triumph of the individual against his base desires, as well as return to normalcy uh, on what is known as our natural disposition of fitra. So eating and drinking is part of normalcy. Yeah? Yeah, it's part of our fitra that when we're hungry, we eat, when we're thirsty, we drink. These are things that are uh, restrained during the month of Ramadan. So at the end of Ramadan, we return back to our natural disposition. Uh, but it's also because we recognize that 
the whole month of Ramadan has been a training ground for us to be a better person. Uh, and that also calls for uh, a bit of celebration also, where we feel that uh, our soul is a bit more purified. Lah. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, that's why uh, Ramadan is also known as a madrasa, which is uh, or a school. It's a school to train us to be better individuals and cleanse our soul in this period. So Hari Raya then uh, is not to open the floodgate and then you become uh, your bad self before Ramadan. No, you're supposed to continue being your good self uh, as how you have trained yourself to be during Ramadan. Ah, now um, determining the end of and the start of the end of Ramadan and the start of Shawwal is is uh, part of this whole um, observance. Yeah. Um, the Muslim calendar, known as Hijrah, is based on the lunar cycle, which is different from the Gregorian calendar that we are familiar with, uh, that is being used uh, by us, uh, uh, which is based on the uh, solar uh, or, or the sun cycle. Yeah? Uh, in the lunar calendar, uh, each month lasts either 29 or 30 days, and hence a total of 354 days per, per lunar year. Now, the traditional method... Um, uh, hang on, let me see. This thing is uh, blocking me. Yeah. Okay. The traditional method of determining the start of a new month is uh, is to look out for the crescent moon. Uh, that that's why you know uh, the the crescent uh, plays a significant uh, role in Islamic symbols. Yeah. Uh, so the traditional method is you you go out to some uh, high location. Uh, on a hill or a, a mountain and um, on a clear sky and you look out for the crescent moon after sunset on the 29th of each month. If you can see the, the, the sliver of the, 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 the moon, uh, then it marks the beginning of the subsequent month. But if you can't see it, then you continue until the 30th day. And then the following day will be the new month. Yeah. Uh, so it's interesting to see that uh, in throughout the world, some Muslim communities uh, will still rely on moon sighting. Uh, because uh, of uh, they rely on the saying of the prophet uh, about uh, uh, seeing the moon and they follow to the letter of it. That's why they continue using moon sighting to determine the start and end of Ramadan. Uh, and this is known as Rukia. Uh, in Singapore, um, of course, you know, where can you go up to to, to find, uh, to, to look at the moon? Uh, maybe what's the highest building in Singapore? Maybe MBS, Marina Bay Sands, and then you start to look for the moon. It's almost impossible because... Um, uh, the conditions are different, right? Uh, uh, so we rely more on astronomical as well as mathematical calculation known as HISA. Yeah, so these are way in advance you are able to calculate uh, uh, the, the start of the new month. Uh, then you find that because of these differences in approach, some will rely on calculation, some will rely on uh, uh, what uh, moon watching. So it continues to be debated in the Muslim societies throughout the world. Some more traditional Muslim society will not rely on uh, calculation. They would still insist on looking for the for the moon, uh, but not in a lot of modern, more modern societies and also in urban centers. Yeah, uh, what is interesting from this whole debate is you you see the the issue of um, central versus local authority. In Indonesia, for example, people are still debating about this in in, in many uh, circles, right? So the more traditional one in some villages and all, they have their own local authority and they will insist on using the Rukia method. Uh, whereas the uh, main uh, religious body will just do the calculation that is up and then will declare way in advance uh, when is Hari Raya, right? Yeah, so, so you find that some, sometimes you find in, in some countries, even in Indonesia, uh, one group will celebrate Hari Raya earlier than the other or, or later than the other. So that, be, that, that is because of uh, the authority that they rely on to determine uh, the end of the Ramadan as well as the start of Shawwal. Um, it's also interesting that this debate also uh, creates certain um, uh, ways of thinking about issues. Yeah? Uh, that for those who rely on moon sighting, there is always this anticipation and excitement. I, I, I must uh, say that it, it adds to the whole celebration mood, you know, when you're waiting that, oh, tomorrow is, uh, is Shawwal, uh, and then you know, um, people come back and say, no, we have not sighted the moon. Uh, okay, then tomorrow we must fast again. And then, but we know the next day will be uh, Hari Raya. Uh, but if someone comes back and say, hey, we saw the moon, then everyone will be uh, very, very joyous and then uh, we'll be uh, celebrating and shouting, hey, tomorrow is Raya. You know, so there's a, a, a bit of anticipation and excitement 
uh, in traditional societies versus planning and standardization. Uh, some some uh, people will say, no, 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 we, we need to standardize this. We, we need uh, more planning because, you know, how can I run my business, for example, uh, not knowing uh, clearly when it's going to be Hari Raya because I need to plan things in advance. Also, in a modern society, everything has to be planned out, right? You have your calendar way in advance so that the government can also designate uh, your public holiday. Imagine if you don't know when it's Hari Raya, it's either on this day or that day, and then how do you plan in advance uh, your public holidays or what you want to do, how you want to uh, plan your, uh, your, your celebration and things like that. Uh, there's also the issue of technology also in this whole entire debate because what is the uh, technology that you use to, to, to do your moon sighting, for example, right? So you can see some, some uh, communities will have telescopes that are able to really catch uh, the moon, but some rely on naked eye, then that's, that's, that's very, uh, uh, it can, can be problematic, yeah? Uh, because the naked eye sometimes cannot see uh, really uh, well, uh, given uh, surrounding lighting and things like that. The location also matters, yeah? Uh, depends on which part of the world you are, you are at, and therefore in some areas you are able to see better than other areas. Uh, and in Singapore, definitely, you, it's very difficult to see because uh, we have a lot of lighting uh, uh, in our city, uh, and therefore it actually blocks a clear view of the sky uh, to be able to see. Um, so these are some interesting issues about determining the end of Ramadan and the start of Shawal. Now, how do Malay celebrate Hari Raya Puasa now? Let's go into the celebration itself. Now, this is interesting, and since we are talking about intercultural elements, um, the word Puasa, it's actually from Sanskrit, Upavasa, uh, which means abstinence, yeah? Uh, and this really shows the assimilation of Islam within the Malay cultural heritage. In fact, a lot of uh, religious terms in Malay are actually a continuation of words that had pre-existed even before the coming of Islam to, to, to this part of the world. Uh, like Puasa is one thing, yeah? so we continue to use Puasa, right? Uh, we don't use Saum here. Yeah, we use puasa, and uh, and it's not seen as anything wrong. Uh, we acknowledge this uh, rich intercultural element in, in Malay society. Uh, a lot of our Malay terms like uh, uh, surga, neraka, uh, it comes from uh, Sanskrit. Yeah, um, uh, and uh, we we see this as part of our cultural heritage. Yeah, and. As Hari Raya approaches, uh, then you find that the buzz of activities also increases, especially in the last 10 days of Ramadan. And now uh, we are in the final uh, days of Ramadan. Um, uh, you can see uh, the excitement starts to build up, but now it's dampened because ah, we have been told that we have only five uh, uh, house visits and not more than two houses a day. So a lot of people uh, uh, scaling down. Oh no, just last week I just bought my Hari Raya clothes now this new ruling come, okay, we'll just appear on Zoom, meet family members on Zoom. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, people are still excited about uh, Hari Raya. Yeah? Uh, in the last week of Ramadan, uh, Malay households will uh, light, light up uh, lights. Yeah? Uh, of course, in villages, uh, you know, Lampu Cholo or Kerosene Lamp will be uh, light up. Uh, now, uh, it's, you, know, you don't use uh, Kerosene Lamp, uh, but you use Lampu Lap Lip. So, you know, um, you know the blinking lights, uh, uh, I do not know in English what you call it, uh, you know, those, those drinking lights that you find in Malay homes, uh, uh, especially during Ramadan, but not just Malay homes, now Christmas also you, people hang, hang uh, this lighting or even in Dipavali and things like that. Uh, or uh, uh, in, in, in kampongs you, you light up the candles. Uh, I remember when I was younger, um, uh, when it comes to, to the last uh, 10 or 7 days of uh, Ramad uh, Ramadan, then uh, we will on all the lights in the house to make the house look brighter. Uh, and uh, my mom would say, oh, ni malam tu joleko. We call it malam tu joleko. I, I, I think this, this term even uh, is not quite well known uh, amongst the younger generation. Uh, but we used to, to be very excited about malam tu joleko because we know that Ramadan is coming to an end, Hari Raya is going to come soon. Uh, and we on all the lights to, to, to create excitement. Um, in uh, of course, this Malam Tujo Leko has no basis in uh, Islamic tradition. It's more of a Malay cultural uh, assimilation of ideas. Uh, in Islamic belief, the last 10 days of Ramadan is special because any one of these 10 days can be the night of power or Laila Tukadar, where this night is supposed to be the most holiest of nights 
where God will forgive your sins. You ask God for forgiveness and, and your whatever uh, uh, worship that you do, the merits will be multiple. So during these last 10 days of Ramadan, a lot of Muslims will engage in a lot of prayers and a lot of uh, pious activities because they want to uh, get this night of power, which we do not know when exactly is this night, but it's within the last 10 days of Ramadan. Uh, so probably with this idea of Lailatul Qadar, uh, uh, with uh, Malay uh, beliefs, uh, uh, pre-Islamic beliefs, uh, it, it merges into uh, what is known as Malam Tujo Leko, where the practice of keeping homes well lit during the last week of Ramadan uh, is both a combination of the religious significance uh, of uh, uh, Lailatul Qadar, uh, as well as the idea of the like uh, being a significant element in Malay cosmology. Of course, light here in Malay is called Cahaya, and it's also Chaya in, in Sanskrit also. So again, you can see how uh, the assimilation of ideas uh, coming into place, uh, where, you know, why you on the lights uh, during Malam Tujur Leko uh, is possibly also to keep yourself awake uh, in order for you to do your night prayers in the hope of getting the marriage during the light of the so it's really a combination of ideas uh, that makes it unique uh, is how it's being practiced in, in the Malay world. Uh, now, another interesting thing I want to highlight is this continuation of tradition and goodwill uh, during the first day of Hari Raya. You will find in uh, Sulalatu Salatin, which is the uh, genealogy of kings, but also translated as the Malay annals. Uh, it was mentioned that it was customary for the king to go to the mosque wearing a turban with a rope uh, on the day of uh, Hari Raya, on the day of Eid, uh, uh, and which Malay subjects cannot wear even during marriages uh, unless bestowed by the king. So there is a special uh, garment here where only the king can wear the turban and a rope on the first day of Hari Raya in order to go to the mosque to perform the Raya prayers. Yeah, uh, And after Eid prayer, uh, the Bandahara or the prime minister and the senior ministers will enter the palace awaiting the arrival of the king who will then come mounted on an elephant and, uh, and riding it to, to, to the royal days. Now, this tradition of meeting the king yeah, uh, is continued uh, even till today. It's called the custom of Mengadap Sultan or visiting the palace uh, to, to, to see the king. Uh, it's continued to, to today and you can see how Singapore is very much tied up to the old uh, uh, Malay Sultanate uh, in, in, in Johor, which was a remnant of the Sultanate of Malacca. Uh, and the Sultan of Johor continues the tradition by hosting the Hari Raya open house. Of course, it's no longer the king will be riding on the elephant and then everyone will be waiting for his arrival. No, no more like that. But it's on the first day of Raya, uh, the Sultan of Johor uh, will be hosting the Hari Raya open house. And Singapore every year will send a representative from the ministerial level. Um, uh, it's normally, uh, you can see in the picture, this was a few years ago, that's uh, the DPM Heng Sipket and also Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan. Uh, every year, Singapore would send someone. But of course, it, it's, it's not the Prime Minister, it's always uh, uh, someone below. Yeah? And, and it's a continuation of tradition, not to mengadap Sultan, but also, uh, but, but, but rather to, 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 to maintain the goodwill relations. And that shows how intricate link intricately linked Singapore is still to, to, to the Malay world. Yeah. Now, how do Malay celebrate Hari Raya Puasa? How do uh, the, the ordinary Malay celebrate Hari Raya Puasa? On the morning of Hari Raya, Muslims are encouraged to perform the Sembahyang Raya or Solat IDV3. Sembahyang is worship or uh, the Arabic is Solat. Uh, and this is where families will be uh, dressed up and then they will go to the mosque. Uh, to do the morning prayer. Uh, and interestingly, uh, this is the prayer where women are also encouraged to come out of the house and to go and perform the, the worship. Yeah? So uh, it's interesting conversation that we are having here in Singapore where you know uh, most now have to limit uh, 100 spaces for solid uh, Hari Raya. Uh, do we think also about how many percentage of it we are going to accord to, to the women or is it all for men? Uh, so these are conversations that we are having uh, and COVID has thrown this situation uh, uh, for us to, to think about this. Yeah? But uh, in the tradition, in the prophetic tradition, women are encouraged to, to perform the prayer in the mosque. In fact, the whole family will go. Um, some, you know, some Muslim uh, 
uh, groups will say that we don't do the worship in a mosque, we have to do it in an open space. And this, uh, you will find that uh, uh, some groups, like for example in Singapore, the Muhammadiyah uh, organization normally will hold the Hari Raya prayer in either an open field or they will book a stadium because they follow this tradition where the Prophet encouraged uh, this worship uh, of uh, it, uh, prayer to be held in an open space. So they, they, they uh, follow the letter of, of the, the saying and therefore they don't do it in a mosque, they do it in an open space. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't matter whether it's in a mosque or in an open space, what matters is the prayer is done in the morning of Hari Raya. And during the prayer session, the Imam or the person who leads the prayer will also be delivering a sermon. And in Singapore, the sermons are all issued by the Islamic Religious Council of Singapore. So you'll find a standardized sermon here. Of course, there might be one or two more who, whose Imam might want to add on to the sermon or say their own uh, uh, written sermon, uh, but uh, otherwise it's, it's all standard. Uh, after the Raya prayers, some will then visit the cemetery for their deceased loved ones. You'll find now that there is also a, a discussion around this because some Muslim scholars say, no, no, you, it's a day of celebration. You should not be going to the, to the graveyard in the morning. You can do that uh, in other days, uh, you know, in the month of Shawwal, but don't do it on the first day because, you know, it befits the purpose of celebratory mood. Yeah? Uh, but for, for Malays, they don't think it that way, you know. They think that this is a day where I want to be reminded of my loved ones. And therefore, after the going to the mosque, they will go to the grave to do supplication. But also some scholars who are a bit more puritanical, perhaps, you can call it as such, they will say that, you know, you make it like a festival going to the graveyard with all your nice clothes and all that. That's not supposed to be what the, the, the cemetery is all about. Yeah. So there's an ongoing debate between this practice, but a lot of Malays still continue this practice. Uh, and I think there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Malays also then, uh, they practice this uh, uh, act of seeking mutual, seeking of forgiveness from family members and friends. Uh, the, 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 the young will usually, you know, when they meet the elders, they will kiss their hands and they ask for forgiveness. And if you are children, you'll be expecting the green packets. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what's the rate right now. Uh, but, uh, this is like your angpao, you know. Uh, uh, but of course, it's, it's just tradition, yeah. It's, it's not part of uh, exaltation of the religion. Uh, then they will be dressing up in Hari Raya clothing, such as baju kurung that comes in various colors and you will wear the kind something. A typical day in Hari Raya uh, uh, comprises of house visiting with the younger ones, normally visiting the elderly who will stay at home. And it depends on your seniority. For example, you know, my uncles who are number two or three will be visiting uh, uh, my father who is the first in the family who will stay at home. So my father will not be going out because he's number one in the family. Uh, and my uncles who's number two, three, four, you know, they, they will then visit uh, based on seniority. So this is how um, you know, typically it's, it's uh, the, the day will look like. Now, a bit about traditional Malay outfit for Raya. Of course, now it's a modern society, so people wear all kinds of things. Uh, but typically, there will be a songko, uh, you, you know, the black uh, cap here, hat, and then you wear the something. Now, the way you wear the something, also there are many forms. Uh, of course, if we only had a physical session, I can show you how to wear the something, yeah? Either you make it into a bun, like a flower type, or you can just roll it. Um, some people say that if you... If you are uh, not married, your, your something must be above your knee. If you are married, then it goes below your knee. So that indicates whether you are available or not when you go visiting your relatives. <laughs> uh, and then you, uh, the, 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 the one you put on the feet, uh, of course, people can just wear shoes, but uh, typically also people buy the chapal, we call it. Yeah? Uh, and the, 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 the neck uh, of the baju kurung also has different forms. Uh, this, the more common one is known as cekak musang. So cekak musang is, a, uh, you know, the um, cekak is like you, what, what do you call that? Uh, uh, the, the, the thing that you trap the fox in, you know, that, that thing that goes <laughs> around that. So it looks like cekak musang. So that, that is the form. Uh, but there's also the teluk belanga type, which is very much more uh, open, rounded like that. For, for female, uh, you, you can wear the tudung, or it's also known as selendang, or you don't wear uh, the tudung. Uh, and then uh, there's also the kebaya, and this is a kebaya modern as an example. There's also the baju kurung kedah, which is uh, uh, slightly uh, shorter compared to the typical baju kurung, which is longer, where the, the, the blouse is longer, yeah? Uh, and now a bit about some raya cuisine. Uh, 
Hari Raya Puasa is also known as, uh, uh, you know, where the, your cuisine is supposed to be sweet. Why sweet? Maybe because it's association with, uh, you know, when you are fasting, you are recommended to break your fast with something sweet because you need the the, uh, the energy, you know, when uh, after a day of fasting. So you need something sweet to, to quickly be absorbed by the body. Uh, and that's why dates are recommended because dates are sweet and contains the nutrients that can be absorbed by the body quickly. And also because it's tradition that dates are commonly found in the Middle East, but you can just break your fast with anything that is sweet. And because of that, uh, a lot of the Raya cuisines are known to be sweet. Uh, although, of course, savory food also uh, are common and the kind of savory food is typical of Malay dishes like uh, rendang. Yeah? So rendang is very popular uh, during Hari Raya. Also because rendang, once you cook, you can keep it for several days. Yeah? So you, Raya, you're so busy visiting, you don't have to keep on cooking a new dish every, every day. Uh, it's at, uh, you, you eat it with ketupat uh, or lontong or, or uh, lemak. Yeah? You're very familiar with this food. Then some of the common uh, kueh, which I really miss a lot, uh, I hope um, I'll be able to get them, uh, will be kueh bangkit. Uh, and then there's a thing called bantaplok saloma, uh, because it looks like uh, bantaplok is your, what do you call that? When you sleep your bolster, yeah? And then uh, kueh tart, and then you also have kueh makmo. Um, and sometimes kueh makmo inside you either find kacang, kacang is peanuts, or you find uh, dates. I like the kueh makmo with dates inside. Yeah, it's very sweet and nice. There's also biskut suji. And I know in the Indian community also, watalapan is quite uh, common also. Uh, it's a Sri Lankan uh, sweet um, pudding. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, so it's something that is, it, it really depends on the culture. Yeah, of course, in the Arab world, they don't eat this. Uh, you have your kebab and you have your other uh, Middle Eastern delicacies. Yeah. Okay, now let me move quickly to Hari Raya Haji. Uh, the significance of Hari Raya Haji now. Um, See, so you, you, you get two Hari Rayas uh, for, for one talk, <laughs> even though we are just going to have Hari Raya Puasa first. Yeah? So uh, Idul Adha or Hari Raya Idul Adha is a festival to celebrate the final moments or the performance of the pilgrimage uh, of Hajj. Yeah? So performing Hajj or pilgrimage is the fifth pillar of Islam uh, and Muslims who are able and can afford to must perform the Hajj in Mecca at least once in their lifetime. So if they can afford it and they're able-bodied, they're supposed to, to perform at least once in their lifetime. And uh, it's a very big affair. I think it's one of the largest gathering, religious gathering in the world uh, every year. Of course, now with COVID situation is different, yeah? Uh, the festival is also a commemoration of the story of Prophet Abraham. Now, if you are familiar with the biblical story, Prophet Abraham or Ibrahim, uh, we call him in, in, in Muslim tradition, he had a dream where uh, God asked him to sacrifice his son. Uh, of course, in the Muslim tradition, his son is Ishmael, but in the biblical tradition, his son is Isaac. Uh, so he was very distraught by it, but eventually he said, if God says so in my dream, I, will, uh, I, I have to do it. Uh, but in the final moment before he, he cut the throat of uh, his son, uh, God sent an angel who replaced uh, his son with a ram. Yeah? So there are questions about this uh, 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 incident yeah uh, to what extent for example do we follow the commands of god even though it goes against your common sense you know like, uh, how can god tell you to kill your own son you know uh, but there are people who debated and say no this is something that comes in a dream maybe he had misinterpreted that's why god is educating him uh, not to do so and replacing it with a ram but whatever the the discussion is that replacement with a ram is something to be celebrated uh, and therefore, Muslims do the sacrifice of animal uh, uh, ritual sacrifice as a way of commemorating this incident also. Uh, and Muslims who can afford to are encouraged to do this animal ritual sacrifice. It's known as kurban. Uh, usually, it's a lamb, a cow, ox, or camel. In Singapore, you can't get camel, yeah? So, you, you normally settle for lamb, cow. Um, and these animals are flown here, in here to Singapore, or some Muslims choose to do the sacrifice overseas. Uh, the meat of the animal is what matters because the meat then will be distributed to the poor and to other beneficiaries. Again, you see how rituals play an important role in terms of social cohesion, uh, especially linking uh, those who have and those who have not. Yeah. So this is always about uh, the beneficiaries or the poor who will receive the meat of the sacrificed animal. 
because in the ancient time, to be able to own goats and sheep and to be able to sacrifice them means you are part of their wealthy class. Yeah. Uh, today, maybe you ask, uh, want to sacrifice, you know, maybe what you sacrifice something like your estate or your, your Lamborghini and things like that. But no, we follow tradition. We continue sacrificing animals and we distribute it to the poor. Uh, of course, in the Quran, the sacrifice is mentioned as such. It is not their meat nor their blood that reaches God. It is your piety that reaches him. So the, the animal sacrifice is not in vain. Yeah, It's supposed to show your piety. And that piety is connected to the distribution of the meat to the poor and other beneficiaries. So that is what matters. Yeah, It's not the meat nor the, the, the blood is what the Quran says. Uh, and in Islam, the sacrifice of the animal must meet the standards of animal welfare. I think this is extremely important and you need to know. It is not a matter of mass massacre of animals as how, you know, in some societies, the way the visuals and all that, it's really not very helpful because there are certain standards in place in terms of doing the sacrifice. For example, you cannot allow the lamb or the goat or the sheep that is going to be sacrificed, uh, see the, the egg being done to the other sheep or animals in, in that whole process. This is not to create distress in the animal before the sacrifice, yeah? Because uh, scientifically also, you know, when animals are distressed, it releases a lot of toxins in their bodies and therefore it's not good. And secondly, your knife must be swift, uh, your, your knife must be sharp and, and you cannot, uh, the regulation is you cannot have more than two cut because then it will cause a lot of suffering to the animal. It must be one swift cut, uh, or possibly or at most two, uh, and then you allow the blood to 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 exit the body because uh, blood carries certain diseases. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in, in Singapore we have adopted very stringent regulation on this, where uh, public members of the public are no longer allowed to view the animal sacrifice in view of animal uh, welfare. Yeah. So uh, in Islam, this is something that is very much important in the way we sacrifice the animal. So it, it's not a, uh, supposed to be. Uh, done with spectacle, yeah. It's supposed to be done with a lot of uh, remembrance of God and also with animal welfare needs uh, uh, being put in place. Now, uh, other than the kurban or the sacrifice of the animal, uh, Hajj is also a season uh, that is very much uh, tied to the way Singapore also has developed in the early uh, years. Uh, and Haji uh, in Singapore, uh, the pilgrimage. Uh, uh, has how it uh, evolved in Singapore is a, a very important event every year, uh, at least in the early 20th century. Uh, if you go to Kampung Glam, for example, you know, at the end of, uh, of, of, of the Busora Street and then further down, that's where uh, the Royal Park Hotel, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that used to be, uh, that is on reclaimed land. Previously, that's where all the ships uh, will be docked in order to bring people to Mecca. Uh, for the pilgrimage, uh, it was sailed to Jeddah uh, uh, and uh, or bringing people back from pilgrimage. So Singapore was the uh, embarkation and disembarkation point. Uh, and this was as early as uh, late 19th century as well as the early 20th century. And Singapore played a significant role in the pilgrimage network then. Uh, uh, and that's where, as mentioned, the beach road area was where the ships would be docked, taking the pilgrims from various parts of Southeast Asia, especially from Indonesia because they have to pass through the Straits of Malacca all the way to the Indian Ocean, all the way to, to the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula and to Jeddah. Uh, interestingly, uh, you will find uh, that some will not make it to Jeddah uh, and Singapore was the furthest they could go. Also because it depends on the amount of money that they have. You know, normally people will just uh, 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 keep a lot of money uh, in order to bring them for a journey. They will just do the journey bit by bit from, from their hometown, they go to Singapore, and then see whether they can work or they can apply their trade or do some business, commercial work, uh, and then get paid. And then they will collect the money, they will keep it, and then they will find another place to, uh, to go to, uh, maybe to, 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 to India before they go all the way to, to, um, uh, to Jeddah. So interestingly, some will eventually decide, that, okay, I'm not continuing this trip, and then they will go back. And they will be known as Haji Singapura. Yeah, that means uh, they're haji. Uh, you know, when people perform the pilgrimage, they are called haji. Or for female, they're called haja. So if Singapore was the last point, the final point where they can go, there's the furthest they can go, they go back, then in their hometown, they, they, they'll be known as haji Singapura. Uh, or if they go all the way to Penang and they come back, uh, they were known as haji Penang. Haji Penang. 
Yeah. So uh, it's very interesting uh, network uh, uh, transmission of, of people and also ideas. Uh, and Haji Lane and the surrounding Kampung Glam area was where uh, Hajj items were being sold. So you need to buy your ihram, you know, your white piece of cloth, and then your tali pinggang, your, your belt in order to keep your ihram in place. And all this, your Songko Haji, uh, all will be sold in these areas. Uh, and it's a very vibrant uh, area in, in, in the early 20th century. It was also the heart of Malay uh, cosmopolitan networks. You'll find that Singapore became a metropolis for the Malay world in the early 19th century, bringing a network of ideas through the burgeoning of publication houses. Because when they go to Mecca for their pilgrimage, they don't just stay in Mecca, they will also travel to other parts of the Arab world, especially to the learning center in Cairo. They will go to Al-Azhar University or, or Cairo itself. Uh, uh, and then that is where in the late 18th, uh, eight, sorry, late, late 19th century and also early 20th century, there's a lot of uh, reformist ideas that develop uh, in Cairo, especially uh, in Egypt. Uh, and you know that one of the key modernist uh, reformist uh, thinkers in the Muslim world is Muhammad Abdul, who was the grand Sheikh of Al-Azhar University. And he was pushing for reform ideas. And these ideas were actually brought back to Singapore through this Hajj network. Uh, and his writings were being translated into Malay, uh, being published in, in the Kampung Glam area. Uh, one of the biggest publication house was the Ahmadiyya Press, uh, which currently, I think, if I'm not mistaken, is the Heritage Hotel, uh, you know, at, uh, opposite Textile Center there. Uh, so these uh, translated uh, works from the Arab world will then be redistributed across the uh, uh, Malay world. And that created uh, the modernizing force for Malay society. And Singapore was, the, was the, the, the starting point. And all that is made possible because of this connection with Hajj travel. So I think uh, I will stop here. Uh, I'm mindful of the time also. And uh, I'll be very happy to take your questions and also your comments. And also your sharing on how Hari Raya works out in your own uh, cultural spheres. I'll be very happy to take your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Imran. It was very illuminating, um, especially how you explained um, how the two Hari Rayas are celebrated, especially among the Malay community in Singapore. It was very interesting for us to know. And I also found especially interesting um, how um, technology plays a role as well with how these two uh, festivals are celebrated and how time has a way of changing how these things are celebrated as well. Um, so thank you so much for your illuminating speech. Uh, so I'd like to open the floor to questions. Feel free to write them in the chat or to jump in. Uh, but for the first question, I'd like to invite the founder of CSTC, Mr. Arun Magrinen, to pose the first question to get the ball started. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Arun. Thank you so much. Um, Imran, that was the most comprehensive uh... Uh, a presentation. Sorry, we had to rush you. Um, but, uh, you know, since there is uh, not much time left, let me go straight to uh, a question that has been uh, on my mind for some time. There are two fundamental ideas in the two uh, 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 festivals. The first one is, uh, you know, Puasa, which you said uh, comes from the word Upabasam, uh, which is both Sanskrit and Tamil and many other Indian languages. This is used. And that sense uh, of um, you know abstinence the practice of abstinence is very common to hindus uh, for millions and millions of hindus now that triggered the uh, thought whether just like in islam and hinduism whether there are chinese observations of a similar kind the other fundamental idea is sacrifice which is uh, for hari raya haji and as in Islam, in Hinduism too, there is sacrifice uh, for, at one, at one stage, they even sacrifice humans. They call it Narapali. But the idea is basically uh, sacrificing something and through that act of sacrifice, uh, sharing something, and then finally appealing to God's blessings. I wonder whether in the Chinese tradition, there is something similar to that. So it would be wonderful if we can have a, a very quick, uh, uh, you know, a chat about the commonalities among the three great traditions in Singapore. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be very, uh, I'll be excited to hear the comments from from other uh, communities about this fasting. But I do know that um, at least in the Quran, uh, it was acknowledged that fasting is not unique to the Muslims. Uh, mm. And there's, there's a verse in the Quran which says, uh, 
fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. And we do know that in the Christian tradition, uh, in the Jewish tradition, there's also uh, similar forms of fasting, although the details might differ. Yeah, uh, the Baha'is also I know fast. As far as I'm concerned, the Baha'is uh, fasting uh, uh, is more similar to the Muslims uh, in terms of not being able to consume food and drink uh, from dawn to dusk. Uh, but theirs is a lesser number of days. Uh, Muslims uh, 29, 30 days uh, for, for them, it's 17 days if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and of course, in other communities, uh, different forms of fasting exist uh, for different um, reasons. But I think there is something common across where it's about the idea of abstinence in order to build the resilience in us and also our devotion uh, to, to controlling our base desires to make us better persons. Uh, and also to try and relate to those who uh, are not as privileged as us. Uh, uh, of course, fasting is not about uh, identifying ourselves with the poor because at, at, at the end of the day we can still look forward to having our meal after the sun comes down but not for those who are really uh, extremely poor they will have to fast for longer days and even uh, years things like that but at least we try to build a bit of empathy uh, through our fasting process I think that is something that is taught across all religions and across all communities and cultures also hi hi okay I just have a question about it's like a cultural assimilation as well uh, it's a, since it's a multicultural society, so I wish to know whether the green packet tradition is a uh, original, like um, they pick up from Chinese community. Is a Chinese <laughs> practices, or is it have an origin in Malay tradition? I know Indian communities actually they have a so-called a purple packet or something. I think <laughs> during the Deepavali they will be given out. <laughs> I'm I'm not sure whether this is because of uh we are living in a multiracial society. Yeah. yeah, this is some like an um, interracial influence. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but I mean, I do not know the uh, actual origin of this uh, uh, Malay Ang Pao's, <laughs> but clearly it's something uh, that uh, it's, it's possibly uh, is because giving uh, charity is, uh, we call it sadaka, uh, charity is, is always encouraged, uh, and that is being done throughout Ramadan. But then after Shawal, also, uh, you want to create more joyous occasion, especially uh, to children. So for, for, for Malay practice, uh, it's normally given to children or maybe from the, the children to their parents who are very old. Uh, it, it doesn't follow that kind of prescription where you know either you're married or not married in order to receive. That, that doesn't apply in, in the Malay Yes, practice. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I want to address also uh, Karun's uh, point about uh, sacrifice also. Yeah, I, I think that's a very uh, pertinent thing because some people are also uh, questioning this whole idea. Do we really need this mass sacrifice of animals? And sometimes the internet, you know, you show how it's being done in some other parts of the world. It's really gory and things like that. And as I mentioned, that is not how it's supposed to be. Uh, the animal welfare needs are supposed to be paramount. Uh, and it's also about uh, the distribution of the meat to the poor. It's not just an indiscriminate killing that we are talking about. And I do know that there are a lot of sensitivities, even in India, where uh, uh, one of the emperors, uh, Mughal emperor, actually prohibited uh, slaughtering of beef in order to respect the local Hindu community who uh, view the cows uh, as a sacred animal. Yeah, and it's still continuing in, in, in some parts of India where Muslims do not practice uh, 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 the slaughter out of respect for their Hindu neighbors. Uh, and also in uh, some parts of Indonesia also. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of variety of this. Uh, practice. Hi everyone, thanks for the speech. Uh, just a quick question, sorry, yeah, yeah, it's my turn to take care of that. Quick question uh, related to what Arun was asking as well. I think uh, traditions and practices are always evolving and I think they move across time and space and it's unidirectional, I mean it moves in many directions. Do you observe any such practices like, you know, for example, the Chinese community, the Yisheng from Singapore has gone back to uh, China and, and even to, to Taiwan and Hong Kong. Do you see a similar uh, traditions or practices moving from maybe from Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, back to uh, the Middle East, or any new practices or old practices that are coming in our direction? Ah, um, no, off the top of my mind, I can't think of any. Of course, there are some other traditions, yes, but not uh, necessarily uh, linked to Hari Raya or to Eid. Um, uh, the transmission of uh, cultural practices from, from this part of the world to other parts of the world do occur. Uh, we do know, for example, um, uh, uh, sizable Malay community uh, uh, 
uh, from the 17th century onwards who resides in Mecca and they become teachers to the Arabs also there. Uh, this are, uh, and they would call us as the Jawis. Jawis means from, from the Malay world. Uh, and uh, some scholars are uh, residing there and teaching uh, the, the Arabs uh, there. And of course, it brings the nuances from the Malay part of the world. Uh, some cultural forms like uh, the sarong, uh, you know, sarong, yeah, uh, which is being used uh, in, in, in amongst the Hadramis, the, the southern uh, Arabs, uh, that came from the Malay world. Uh, and down there, you'll find uh, the kropos also being uh, consumed, <laughs> and they brought uh, from this part of the world. Uh, of course, some people say our satay possibly could have come from, from the kebabs uh, and the, the skewered meat uh, from, from, from Middle East. I, I, I've not really studied on this, but that's some of the theories being proposed. Yeah, so this kind of cultural uh, sharing and transmission is common. So what I think we need to think about is, is there any such, is there such a thing as a cultural exclusivism, you know, where we really look at how we want our culture to be so authentic that it denies the kind of hybridity that is common across all cultures. We do share each other's culture, in, whether it's through language, as I mentioned, some of Malay words actually come from various uh, cultural traditions, uh, or even in our material culture, the way we dress, uh, you know, the, uh, our food, our cuisine, um, uh, and, and many other things. So it's time we acknowledge this intercultural element and hybridity of our own culture instead of maintaining there is this strict, uh, uh, authentic culture that is, uh, you know, exclusive. Then that makes us blind to our history, to our heritage, and to our interconnectedness uh, of the different cultures and civilizations. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much. Um, it was a very, very fruitful session for me because I really understood a lot of different things. Thank you so much. I just have a question, um, very similar slightly similar to what Kartik had asked. Um, what about the younger generation now? You see, um, we're talking about lots of history over here and how it originated. I'm just wondering, <clears throat> over the years, with more and more um, younger generation coming on board, sometimes there, there are certain parts that might be missed or lost along the way. Um, how has things been so far with the Malay community, especially the younger generations? Yeah, I, I think this is a common concern across all communities where the younger generation are losing a, a bit of touch with our cultural her heritage and all that. Um, uh, but it's not something uh, to be, you know, to be worried too much about. I think it's a matter of how we bring uh, the meaning of these cultures to them uh, so that they can appreciate it a bit more. I think a, a lot of cultural practices have lost their, their significance because we have lost the meaning behind it. So it becomes a matter of habits and practices without people understanding why we do certain things. Uh, and when we don't provide that meaning for, for some of these practices, then it's natural that people will just abandon it and go for something that makes more meaning within their own context and, 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 and spheres. Uh, what I do see is that, um, at least when it comes to Hari Raya, right, uh, it's less joyous amongst the young, younger uh, generation. I mean, I personally felt, felt it. Uh, it's very different when you are younger. You know, Hari Raya brings a lot of excitement and we are lo all looking forward to it. But I do not know, maybe because as we grow older also, I think the problem is not just young people. As we grow older also, we so many work, right? We only think, okay, that's one day only. And then you dread uh, having to go to so many relatives' place. How are going to find the time to, to do all this? <laughs> and then, you know, uh, you, uh, for, for, for some also, they, they might be thinking, oh, they have to come up with more uh, 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 green packets uh, so make it simple some people are actually happy with the COVID situation they don't have to travel so much <laughs> but uh, it differs I would say uh, but what I think is important to be emphasized is always try to see these practices with its own meaning behind it and that is something we need to keep on emphasizing why do we celebrate Hari Raya what's the meaning behind it rather than just a matter of uh, doing it because it's being passed on from generation that is what matters, and I think we need to bring that to the younger generation even more. Uh, there are different meaning to even, uh, you know, um, how the Malays conceptualize uh, their sense of clothing, you know, their certain cultural expression. Uh, a lot of these are lost, yeah. So if we can bring that back, that would be helpful, yeah. And actually, I just have a question. Um, how are some ideas or solutions you think in one way to kind of bring back that excitement or at least the awareness and of the different significances um, uh, on these uh, different festivities, especially among the Muslim community and the youngsters? Uh, well, it's something I hope I can hear from a suggestion from others also. But, uh, 
I, I, I don't think it's so much. Uh, I, I think it's the, is, is the whole situation we are in with, with our uh, very busy work life. I think that is the real issue. <laughs> um, and the stress that comes with modern living. Uh, we, we have less joy and, and less space to reflect and less uh, opportunities to come together as a community even. Uh, it's really a very atomized uh, life that we are living. And it's all about working and making money and you know, trying to survive. Uh, and that's what kills culture. Because culture requires vibrancy. It requires people to come together, celebrate, and you need time for that. You cannot just force and say, okay, we've been these two hours, let's celebrate. And after that, you go back to your normal life. It doesn't work that way, yeah? Now, let's look at some of the cultural art forms and we move away from Hari Raya. Let's take a look at like, um, there, are, there are attempts to revive certain cultural practices uh, of, of the Malay world. Like, uh, take for example, Kuda Kepang, you know, the horse dance, yeah? Uh, there's a lot of debate surrounding this, and this is very fascinating because Kuda Kepang actually brings the community together. I remember when I was younger, when you have a Malay wedding, you have Kuda Kepang, everyone will come to the under the block or you know to the open field, and they and and it builds community through that because not just the Malays, the Chinese, Indians, they all come because it's it's a fascinating art form, you know. But of course, some of us were also scared because you know they, they do certain things like uh, eat uh, glass, uh, uh, shredded glass, and then you know they run around. And if you see, you, you don't wear it. You wear it, the, the kuda kepang will come after you. Uh, but it's all part of the fun, uh, and it, it's a communal uh, tradition, in fact. Um, um, but there's also debate whether when they come, when they go into trance, you know, they invoke the spirits. Uh, say, some say this is un-Islamic. It, it needs to be. Remove. That is why it then you when when you constrict that it becomes just a dance, as how it happens uh, under the Malaysian Tourism Board. You know, it's just a, a dance form, but you lose the significance of it. But now I find some groups are trying to revive that, and I, I was quite uh, uh, pleased to see Kuda Kepang being held at the Malay Heritage Centre, uh, and people gathered. Of course, uh, this element of being under demonic possession and trance depends on how you interpret it, right? Uh, and this is where if you don't understand the philosophy behind it, then you don't understand that some of these art forms are actually cathartic, you know, it, it allows you to release certain energy so that it, it has a healing purpose also. Uh, you know, sometimes when you're too stressed, you just really need an outlet and cultural art forms are actually outlet to make better uh, uh, mental health even, you know. Uh, but we don't understand these things. So if only we see it through just one lens, that whether there's demonic possession or not, then we, we miss all the other layers of psychological explanations that can actually help uh, an individual as well as revive the communal spirit of these art forms. Hi, Imran. Hi, Imran. Um, just wanted, I just wanted to ask about the duration of the celebrations, right? Yeah. Since you, you mentioned, mentioned that in the beginning. So one of the reasons you gave us maybe because of this culture of visiting friends and relatives. But in other parts of the Muslim world, why, why, is this, you know, why is this culture of visiting not as prevalent? And therefore, why does, that would explain the high raya or eat being one day or two days rather than a month, right? So what makes Singapore at least in Santara different from the rest of the Muslim world? Yeah, I mean, to be frank, I don't know. I don't know uh, whether it's celebrated for one month because of this, but we can just guess. Uh, um, uh, also, I think in, in some other parts of the world, uh, at least what I know is that uh, Muslim societies, uh, uh, I mean, the, the way they, they are connected are quite different. Uh, in some societies, uh, you are encouraged to visit your neighbors first, not your distant relatives, because your neighbors are your closest to you, and therefore those are the ones that you visited. You, you visit first. So uh, there's a lot more emphasis on your surrounding neighbors uh, rather than your family ties. Uh, but in the Nusantara world, the family ties is much more important. Uh, and they may live in villages that are very far from, from urban centers and all that. So you, you really have to go and visit them. Uh, 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 and um, for, for example, um, in, in Malay society here, we, we don't normally visit our neighbors first, even our Muslim neighbors or Malay neighbors who celebrate Hari Raya. We will go uh, uh, to the end of the island to visit our relatives first, and, and friends and neighbors take uh, sec second or third priority. Yeah, but in other societies, it's slightly different. 
where neighbors are much more important than family ties. So that could be another reason. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, maybe you can also share Imad, uh, how it's being done in, in in some parts of the Arab world, which or even in, in Iran, where you might be more familiar with. It. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've not never actually celebrated Eid in my mother's hometown, Iran, but it's I don't think it's for a month over there. So. Yeah. But as to the reasons why I never thought of it uh, until you mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Iman. I think, Frank, you have another question. Um, oh, yes. Ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Harini. Yeah. Uh, I just have another question. So, like, if the Muslim that are uh, staying in the country, like mm, maybe Russia or North European countries, which is the day times are very long, how are they going to fast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is always puzzle me, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, like if you are in the Antarctica, it's even worse. You know, sometimes you don't have sunset at all. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so I think the the uh, scholars have developed uh, some ways uh, to to overcome this. Uh, so you either uh, follow the uh, there's there's a maximum uh, uh, number of hours where you can pass. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, what um, is it? Seventeen hours. That's maximum. I need to check on that. Yeah. So beyond that, you it's it's humanly impossible, and the scholars say no. You have to break your fast uh, by by that uh, limit, or you can break your fast according to the closest uh, uh, country that uh, is much more reasonable uh, in terms of the hours of fasting, or you can follow the Meccan uh, uh, timing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Iman. Um, I think the Q&A session was very invigorating. We learned so much, uh, but unfortunately we are coming to the end of the program. Uh, so I'll have to pass the time to um, uh, Nimi from NLB. She has a short announcement to make. So yeah. uh, Nimi, please go ahead. Hi, okay, let me share my screen first. So these are uh, an example of uh, Chinese books we have. Okay, the first one is on uh, the customs and uh, the, the practices during Hari Raya Puasa. And then the second one is also about that, uh, everything about Hari Raya that you want to know, okay, for Chinese uh, community. And uh, these are Malay books. Okay, the first thing is about all about A to Z, okay, about Hari Raya in Malay, okay. And then the second book is about uh, Hari, Hari Raya Haji, okay, what you have to do. And the first book is actually also tells about um, uh, why charities uh, practice just now are uh, in run share. So if you want uh, further reading, you can do this. And then lastly, we have Tamil books on Hari Raya. And uh, okay, and then the title is Nombu. Okay, uh, uh, how do you practice Nombu means uh, uh, Hari uh, the Pasa, and then uh, how do you do it? And the second book is also about Hari Raya. So uh, you're most welcome to head out to the library to borrow this book for further reading. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Nimi. Thank you so much. Um, I'd said that um, we don't have time for questions, but we would like to take just one last question. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that we would like to ask uh, Mr. Imran. Perhaps we can organize a second session next year and hopefully in person and we can ask as many questions as we would like. Imran, this was possibly one of the best talks I've attended on uh, Hari Raya Haji and Hari Raya Puasa. And I think... Uh, a lot of the uh, values and the uh, principles behind uh, both of these festivals are, are very uh, applicable to a lot of our day-to-day -day values or morals and ethics. My uh, question for you is, uh, is there an increasing trend of Arabization in the Malay culture in Singapore? This is a very, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a topic that is being debated. Yeah, uh, But let, let me uh, first say that um, this, uh, Transmission of cultures, uh, even from the Arab world to, to this part of the world, is an ongoing process. Um, so this Arabization in itself is not a problem. Uh, because, you know, I mean, Islam itself comes from the Arab world. So can we call that Arabization? Of course, it is in a way Arabization, right? Uh, or the way we dress in a certain way, you know, the Songkho Haji even, you know, the white skull cap, not the black one. The black one actually uh, was mirrored uh, from, from the Indian nationalists, you know. Uh, but the white one, when you come back from Hajj, you, you put on it, that's called uh, uh, Songko Haji, and that's also part of, uh, uh, um, comes from the Arab world. Uh, so Arabization in itself is not the issue. The issue is Arabization when it's being understood within a certain lens. For example, putting Arab culture as superior to the local culture. And therefore, if you were to adopt Arab culture, uh, then you are seen as much more Islamic. 
So that is a failure to distinguish between the values and teachings of the religion and the form that it takes in cultural forms of the Arab world. These are two separate things. So you can be a Muslim without following the Arab culture. But if you think that Arab culture defines Islam, then you are conflating the two and then you put a superiority of Arab culture over Malay or even local cultures, whatever culture, if you are Chinese, Chinese culture, then you put this kind of hierarchy, then this is where Arabization becomes a problem. That's number one, yeah? Uh, number two is when you not just put Arab culture as superior, but the tendency to see your local culture as un-Islamic. And therefore you want to get rid of a lot of these localized expressions of culture. And a lot of people who try to do that, they say, oh, a lot of Malay practices are un-Islamic. Uh, they actually misses the point and they don't understand how Malay wisdom has actually absorbed Islamic values at the same time maintaining its cultural form. Let's take a uh, marriage, for example, right? At one time in the 1980s, especially when people come back from, uh, from their learning in, in, in Saudi Arabia, which has a very slightly more puritanical form of Islam. And they think that, you know, a lot of these uh, the real Islamic ones, and when they come back, they think a lot of Malay practices or cultures are un-Islamic. And one example would be Malay weddings. You know, when you have the, uh, the, the, the bride and the bridegroom uh, seated on the dais, uh, and they think, oh, this is part of Hindu tradition because it's representing Sita Devi and Ramayana. Uh, uh, and therefore we must get rid of this. This is not Islamic culture, uh, but they forgot when the Malays do that kind of wedding, they no longer imagine Sita Devi and Ramayana. <laughs> it's, it's just uh, uh, the, the king and queen of the day. Uh, and it's a form of celebrating people who come to their wedding and uh, uh, putting them on the pedestal because they are the, the bride and the bridegroom of the day and we are, everyone is celebrating and just like the king giving a feast or banquet to, 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 to the guests, right? Uh, it's, it's, it, it's not the religious form. It's a cultural form that absorbs the value of giving the banquet to people who come to their to their wedding party, you know. Uh, but when you conflate all this and you begin to get rid of um, uh, local wisdom, first you don't understand local wisdom. Secondly, you think that uh, things that are local is inferior. Uh, and when you are emptied of your own local heritage, your lo connection to your local cultures, then you become an empty vessel and you will just absorb things that comes from outside. And that is where the danger is because we find that a lot of extremist ideas actually uh, get absorbed in individuals who are alienated from their own cultural tradition and heritage. And therefore they just take anything from abroad, from overseas, from, from elsewhere, they think that this is the identity that they have. Uh, but that is not how at least Islam in this part of the world has assimilated and absorbed the cultural element. And uh, we call this pre-Bumisasi the indigenization of Islam, which uh, the late Abdurrahman Wahid, uh, the, the former president of Indonesia and also leader of the largest Muslim organization in the world, the Nahdlatul Ulama, he promoted the, uh, this idea that Islam is like one big river that connects with all these small river. Uh, and, and all of this, we say, comes from the same source. Yeah, we can't say that Arab culture is uh, superior than Malay culture, Chinese culture, Indian culture. No, it's all part of one big human culture and we must appreciate that and celebrate it. Yeah, but the values cuts across all this and the values being brought by Islam is also the universal values that are also good for humanity as a whole also. And we can learn from each other. I think this is the kind of idea that we must have and not this idea of Arabization as how it's being understood in terms of superiority of Arab culture and getting rid of local wisdom and cultures. Yeah. Very well said, Mr. Imran. I think especially when you said when you're alienated from your own cultural practices, you become an empty vessel for extremist ideas. And, you know, there's no one solitary culture, but, you know, there's human culture and we can learn so much across these different cultures. And I think that's exactly what we're trying to do in today's talk, which is to create better understanding among communities themselves, but also among other communities so that we better understand each other. So thank you so much. A lovely question to end today's session. Um, please look at the chat. We have a feedback survey and we are so heartened that over 60 people have joined this session um, in the past one and a half hours. How did the time run? I have no idea. So please take those uh, two minutes and uh, fill in the feedback form so that we can produce, CSCC can produce much better programs in the future. And before we leave, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Amrana to give us some closing remarks before we end the session. 
I mean, there's nothing more that I want to say, but uh, I really enjoyed this session and I really enjoyed your questions. Um, I think uh, this kind of uh, conversations need to be done uh, more so that we come out of our silos and we begin to appreciate each other's culture, not just each other's culture, but to see the other's culture as part of our own cultures also. Uh, and that's where the, 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 the flavor and the richness of this diversity that we have here in Singapore needs to be appreciated. Uh, and that can solidify our co cohesion uh, and, and we don't see ourselves as uh, being disconnected from each other. Uh, I, I think that is my takeaway from, from today's uh, conversation that I have. Uh, and of course, to everyone, uh, a very happy Hari Raya Puasa uh, in advance. <laughs> and uh, there's still uh, Ramadan is still a few days uh, left and Ramadan Karim to all those who are fasting. And uh, I thank you, Mr. Arun, uh, Dr. Arun again for, for this opportunity to, to the organizers also and to everyone who attend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Imran. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of CSTC, I would like to thank Mr. Imran. I also would like to thank our partners, NLB, uh, Singapore Book Council and Hash Peace. Uh, without your support, this event would not have been possible. And on behalf of CSTC, we would also like to thank everyone that's joined us today. And when we looked at the profile of participants, we were very heartened to see that there were not just Tamils who have joined the session, but a lot of non-Tamils. And that is the purpose of CSTC, to produce programs for all Singaporeans, regardless of which community you're from. Um, and someone on the chat had asked, oh, you know, will this session be recorded? Where do we see snippets? So um, you should follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and you should join our mailing list so that you can get first-hand information if we ever have events to sign up for. And once we have recordings and snippets, we will also post it over there. So you can always stay tuned and catch us there. Uh, and on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you for joining us. And um, it's me, Harini, signing off. Uh, it's been a pleasure moderating this event today. I'd like to thank uh, CSD members, our founder, Mr. Arun uh, Nazrat, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to moderate this session uh, with an eminent interfaith Thought, uh, thought leader like Mr. Imran himself. So thank you everyone for joining us and any feedback, fill up the feedback form and write your feedback on Facebook and Instagram as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again in another event.